Okay, so we talked about the main um, pathway, the general pathway of the air when we breathe. Um, so, and we talked about the different phases or subdivisions of respiration. We're also going to talk about the actual breathing process. So, what parts are involved in breathing? This is the second video or second part to the video lessons. Um, the first line here is talking about the, the main parts that we've already identified along the pathway. So air goes in through your mouth and nose, goes through your trachea, down into your bronchi, your bronchioles, and alveoli. Hmm, there's a couple of other little parts that we're going to talk about along the way, but those are the key, key parts. Accessories that help out are your diaphragm, um, your ribs, and your intercostal muscles. So those are the intermeans between and costal refers to your ribs so the muscles between your ribs. If you were to look at your skeleton, we were looking at the skeleton in class, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of ribs that are attached to our main breastbone, the sternum, and then we have one, two, three that are attached to that bottom seventh one. And then we have two pair, you can see them better on this side, but we have two pair of floaters. And so they all enclose and protect um, the lungs and the heart. So this cavity inside of here that houses your lungs and your heart is known as the thoracic cavity. And along the bottom, of the rib cage, separating the thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity would be your diaphragm. Okay, so if we look a little closer at the lungs, and we did a little drawing that you should uh, check into, check with others, and it's pretty simple and it shows a lot when you do it. Okay, um, it's a really good little study tool, so you should check into what they've done or um, ask and I can help you do it. So we have one pair of lungs that's found in thoracic cavity, which we just talked about. Um, this right lung is larger, a little larger than your left one because of where the heart is positioned. So you can see it a little better here. This one's larger than this one. It has three lobes, whereas the left one has two. And the they're surrounded and protected by two membranes. They're called pleura. The first one that lies right on the lung tissue or right on the organ is called the visceral pleura. And viscera means internal organ. So um, it is the, the membrane that, that lies right on the lung tissue. The one that's outside of that, I lost my cursor again. Uh, the one that's outside of that, that's kind of peeled back on the outer part is the parietal pleura, and parietal is kind of to the outside of. In between the two, there's a space, and that is known as the pleural cavity. And there's some fluid in there that prevents them from sticking and prevents friction. So it helps to reduce friction um, if your lungs come in contact with the rib cage. This I would have given as a blank diagram that you were supposed to label. Okay, so this is the respiratory tract. When you breathe, you breathe in through your nasal cavity or through your mouth cavity. The air comes down into this space. This is that special space called the pharynx. Okay, so this is where if you went to swallow pop or you took in some spaghetti and all of a sudden you coughed, then it can come out through your nose. So that's your pharynx. Also in this space, um, I, things can go down through your esophagus, through your food tube, or down through your breathing tube, your trachea. Okay, so there's a special part called your epiglottis, and that's a flap that covers and protects your trachea and prevents food from going down there, prevents you from choking. Okay, at the top of the trachea, we have the larynx, and the larynx has your vocal cords in it, is your vo voice box. There's the rest of the trachea. The trachea has cartilage, again, to hold it open. That's cartilage rings, and so do the bronchi. So here's the left and right bronchus, 
Okay, bronchi plural. And each bronchus then branches into smaller tubes called bronchioles. So these larger ones, the bronchi, have cartilage, rings, but the bronchioles are too small. If we were to take one of the bronchioles out, and kind of blow it up, then at the very end of it you would find, um, almost looks like a bunch of grapes, and those are the alveoli. Alveolus for one, alveoli for bunch. Okay. Um, your diagram isn't in color, so you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell that this is deoxygenated blood and this is oxygenated blood, but all these little vessels that are surrounding the alveoli are the capillaries, and that allows for the gas exchange because of the close contact. Uh, other labels that are on here, we have one for the left lung, so this is labeling the left lung, and the right lung, the muscles between your ribs, the intercostal muscles, and a rib here. The diaphragm, which is a dome-shaped muscle that is on, separates the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. And also part of the brain that looks after your breathing, which is the medulla oblongata. Okay, so this is part of the brain stem. We've talked about it in chapter nine because it also looks after your heart rate and vasodilation, vasoconstriction, movement of blood through your vessels. There's some animations that are really good to watch that uh, would help you for understanding respiration and different aspects of it. So make sure that you check those out. They're linked on the class notes page and I'll probably also link them in Edmodo too. In terms of the breathing process, um, you should be able to describe it in terms of volume and pressure. Okay, so if you take a big breath in, Okay, when you inhale, your diaphragm is pulling downwards and your rib cage is pulling up and out. So it does that because the muscles that are on the outside between your ribs, the external intercostal muscles, are contracting, pulling towards each other. And because your rib cage is kind of moving outward and upward and your diaphragm is moving downward, that increases the volume that's in your chest cavity. And when you increase the volume, it decreases the pressure exerted by gases inside. So, we've said before that gases move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So they're going to move from the atmosphere where it's higher pressure down into the chest cavity where there's lower pressure. Okay, so that's why air is drawn in when that happens. The opposite happens when you're exhaling. Oh dear, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay, so when you're exhaling, your chest cavity is going to push inward or move back down because your diaphragm is going to relax and go back dome-shaped and your internal intercostals are going to contract while your external ones take a break. Okay, so it pulls your rib cage down and in. So the pressure, or sorry, the volume inside your chest cavity would decrease and the pressure would increase, forcing the air out because the pressure in your chest cavity would be higher than what's out in the atmosphere. So there's a good animation on that. Okay. You'll see this graph. This is in your book. I think it's around page 341, if I remember right. Um, You'll see this graph when we do the little lab activity where you're using what's called a spirometer. Um, usually when they do such a thing, they're checking to see what your lung capacity is, your, your vital capacity really. Okay, so this is the volume of air in your lungs versus time. And this is if you were breathing normal breaths. So in, out, in, out, in, out. And then all of a sudden you take a great big breath as big as you can in, and then a great big breath as far as you can force it out, as much as you possibly can, and then normal breath, normal breath. So the normal breath that we have, like this pattern here, that is your tidal volume, that amount. So it would be about 500 mils of air that's going normally going in and out. Okay, this part from the top of these little waves to the very, very top up here, that is called your inspiratory reserve volume. And that is how much 
extra, you could breathe in if you needed to. So if you're going to maybe go underwater or something, or you're going to blow up a balloon, then you would probably breathe in that huge amount of extra air. Okay? This volume down here is kind of the opposite. It's the expiratory reserve volume. Okay? So it is the amount that you can force out, the maximum amount you can force out after what you've normally breathed out. So, if this is the amount, the highest amount you can breathe in, and this is the lowest, or the farthest you can breathe out, then this is kind of showing you, okay, well this is the, the maximum amount of, of lung volume that kind of goes in and out of my lungs, typically. So that is called your vital capacity. That is the, the amount of air that you can breathe in and out of your lungs, okay? Not the normal amount that you would tend to, but the, the amount that you possibly can use. Breathe in, breathe out, the maximum. But there's this extra little bit down here, okay, that never gets breathed out, and that's important. It's called the residual volume. There's always a residual amount that's left in your lungs so they don't totally collapse and stick together. Okay, so if you were to count that as well as your vital capacity, that tells you your total lung capacity. What is the total volume that your lungs can hold? Well, that's all fine and good. Maybe you have a great lung capacity. Maybe you can take in a whole lot of air, but if you don't have a very good efficiency or respiratory efficiency, then it doesn't help you all that much. Okay, so it's one thing to have a really good lung capacity, but you also want to have a uh, good respiratory efficiency. So that's another term that we describe um, what your lung is capable of, what your lungs are capable of doing. That tells us the rate at which oxygen can be transferred across into your bloodstream. So how effective your lungs are at getting the oxygen in. Now, I think we're going to do regulation mm, we can do regulation okay so just like we talked about regulation of your blood pressure and regulation of your heart rate and regulation of um, your body temperature we're also going to talk about regulation of your breathing now we have two different types of sensors and they both will kick in at different during different situations in your body Normally, when you're just having normal breathing or normal activity, um, it'll be your carbon dioxide sensors that will kick in. Okay, so they're always monitoring and they will kick in if there's an increase in carbon dioxide. So if you're using more oxygen, maybe you were doing something that was more strenuous, so you use more oxygen, that's going to produce more carbon dioxide, and that's a sign, hey, we need to get rid of that carbon dioxide and get in some more oxygen. Okay? So, those sensors are found right in your brain. They're right in the medulla oblongata. Okay? So, once they detect that there's an increase in carbon dioxide, they're going to send a message to the effectors that actually look after your breathing rate. And those are the muscles that we already talked about, the diaphragm and your intercostal muscles. So it sends a message to them and says, hey, we need to get rid of this excess carbon dioxide and in the meantime, bring in some O2. So they increase your breathing movements. Marilyn McDonald to the office with your pictures. Sorry. The other type of sensor only works at certain times, okay? It only works if there's not an increase in CO2. So there are certain times when the CO2 levels are normal, but for some reason there's a decrease in oxygen. So these sensors are found in your carotid arteries, important because they are bringing oxygen to your brain and also in your aorta, also important because they are bringing oxygen to your heart and all your other body tissues. So, these ones kick in, again, when CO2 levels are normal, but oxygen levels are low. And that could be the case when you're at a higher level 
of altitude. So maybe you're on a mountain or something that you're not used to. Oh, I got cut off. Ran out of time. All right, so um, as I was saying, the O2 sensors only kick in when CO2 levels are normal because if they had increased, normally when O2 levels go down, it's because CO2 levels have gone up because you've been more active or doing something. So cell respiration is happening, you're burning food, oxygen is being used up, and CO2 is being made. So if the CO2 levels are normal but oxygen levels are low, then we have to wa have a way of um, noticing that too. So that's when the O2 sensors kick in. And again, that could be when you're at a higher altitude, like on a mountain, or when you're exposed to carbon monoxide. Now, you probably know a little bit about carbon monoxide, uh, but carbon monoxide is, um, it's produced whenever we burn fuels and they don't burn completely, completely. They don't go to completion. So um, when we burn fuels in our car, for instance, we have carbon monoxide coming out of our exhaust. If we're burning fuels to heat our home, then sometimes carbon monoxide could leak. And so we have often have a carbon monoxide detector in our home. Um, in any case, what happens is carbon monoxide has a higher affinity. That means a higher attraction for hemoglobin in your red blood cells than oxygen does. So even though you might be breathing well, if there's too much carbon dioxide around you, then the carbon monoxide is going to bump the oxygen off of your hemoglobin and eventually if you're not taken out of that situation, it can mean that your cells are not going to get oxygen and you could die from it. So um, years ago when there were bad storms and people would get stranded in their cars, sometimes they would keep the car going to keep warm, but the snow would go around and cover the exhaust and then the carbon monoxide would fill the car and unfortunately it, it would sometimes mean that a person might die. The same kind of thing can happen um, you know, in, in a house fire, the carbon monoxide that's being produced during the burning can cause a person to um, die before maybe the fire reaches them or that sort of thing. So um, it's scary and it's scary that um, that, that can happen. It's, it's carbon monoxide poisoning is what we call it. Um, but it's really important that we can detect that, increase our breathing, and as long as we get a good supply of oxygen back to us in time, then that we can recover from that sort of situation. So, like the other cases, we look at this through a negative feedback loop. That is how we regulate a lot of the things that happen in our body. Um, so normal conditions, we use the CO2 sensors. So let's say the perturbing factor was exercise. When you exercise, you need lots of energy for your muscles to work and that sort of thing. So oxygen is being used up and CO2 is being produced. So the perturbing factor is exercise. The stimulus would be an increase in carbon dioxide due to cell respiration. Um, the sensors that are going to kick in are your CO2 sensors because they're de gonna detect the increase in CO2 and they're found right in the medulla oblongata. So there's no need to send a message to the part of the brain because they're already in the medulla oblongata. So they're gonna detect the increase in CO2 and because it's that part of the brain, it interprets the information and sends a message to the effectors. So those are the muscles that are gonna deal with it. So it sends a message to the effectors which are your diaphragm and intercostal muscles. And they will respond by contracting and relaxing faster. So they increase your breathing rate. Okay. Now, the response, remember, is to be the opposite or counteract the stimulus. So the stimulus was an increase in CO2. The, the real response is to get that CO2 down. Okay, so there's a decrease in CO2 as a result because it's exhaled. But the bonus is 
the same time, we're increasing our O2 because we inhale it. And when we get levels back to normal, then these earlier steps will be turned off. So that's under normal conditions. When instead CO2 is normal and oxygen levels are low, then the other sensors are going to kick in. So a lot of it's the same, but there are key things that aren't. So let's have a look. If the perturbing factor was that you're at a higher altitude or exposed to carbon monoxide, then the stimulus in this case would be a decrease in oxygen when carbon dioxide levels are kept normal. So there's no change in them. In this case, the sensory receptors that kick in are the O2 sensors that are found in your carotid artery and your aorta. So since they're not in the brain, they have to detect the decrease in oxygen and send a message to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata, the integrator, will interpret the information and send a message to the effectors. So this part's the same. Okay, it sends a message to them, says, hey, we need to increase the oxygen level, so we need you to breathe faster, so contract and relax faster. And so they do. The response, the key thing about the response, again, it's to counteract the stimulus. So the response is an increase in oxygen since it's inhaled. Bonus is we're getting rid of the excess carbon dioxide that we have around, so it's exhaled. And when nor levels get back to normal, then these earlier steps will turn off. Okay, so the six things shouldn't be new. It's how we apply them to regulation of breathing. That's a little different. I think I will, yeah. This part we're gonna save and do on the next video lesson.